fifth installment of my revisit of the, the Gokaden, the five traditions. So just to re recapitulate what we heard last time when we started with the rice cool. So this is the time frame we were starting off last time. So as you can see here, this is the very like the earliest uh, like uh, traditions of Japanese sword making. We were talking in the first uh, lectures about the Sanjo and Gojo school. So this is all like Heian. Then we were coming to the Abatakuchi school, which starts with the beginning of Kamakura. And the rice school entered uh, the stage somewhere around mid Kamakura. And as mentioned last time, uh, the maker, uh, the, the founder of the rice school, is a little bit obscure. There are not really any works of his that can be authenticated. It's supposed to be uh, established by Kuniyoshi, and his son Kuniyuki. He is regarded as the de facto founder of the school because actually there are a lot of works of his extant, even uh, signed ones. So Rai Kuniyuki, we talked about last year, he uh, is regarded as, as the, the real de facto founder of the Rai school. And today we're going to talk about his successor, uh, Rai Kunitoshi. And uh, many of you will uh, surely know there's this big old question that's uh, there since the Muromachi period, was there one Rai Kunitoshi or were there two Rai Kunitoshis? So, uh, so the good thing is with, when it comes to Rai Kunitoshi, we have a, like a, a, a really large body of work uh, to study and to work with. So just to give you a few, do the, the numbers game again, just to give you a few figures. So Rai Kunitoshi, including those just signed Kunitoshi with two characters, or does all the signed with three characters, right? Kunitoshi, we have 230 Chuyos, we have uh, 50 Tokubetsu Chuyo, and 65 with uh, government designations. So <coughs> national treasures, Chuyo Bunkasai, Chuyo Bichu Tsuhin. And as you can imagine, Tokubetsu holds on and holds on. Uh, also, of course, so there are literally hundreds of works of his around, even a lot of dated ones. So we have a, 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 a pretty decent uh, body of work to study and to come to draw some con conclusions. Mm -hmm. So let's do a little uh, time frame here. So uh, when it comes to uh, dated works of Kunitoshi, again both Nietzsche Kunitoshi, the sign in two characters and those sign with three characters, they range from uh, 1278 to 1321. So, as you can see here, these are all the, the dated uh, body of work we have. 43 years, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, very uh, realistic for a, a sword maker of this time period to just work for 43 years. And uh, it's nothing unusual to have to, for this to be like a single, uh, a single, a single maker who was active for 43 years. So, uh, the interesting thing is, there is one very famous blade of Rai Kunidoshi, this blade. It's in the collection of the Tokugawa Museum. It's dated 1315 and it's also inscribed with the supplement It was made at the age of 75. So we, we can calculate his year of birth, which is very rare for this time. So we can calculate his year of birth as 1240. And again, if we're gonna go back when he was born in 1240, the latest dated one in 1321. Yeah, it's like 81 years of life. It's pretty, uh, pretty. I mean, he, he he was old, but nothing out of the ordinary for for uh, Japan at this time period. And interesting, it's also uh, the first dated blade of Rai Kunimitsu. His son is from 1326. So we can assume that at some time of this period between the latest dated one of Kunitoshi and the, Raikun, the first of Raikun Mutsu, he was probably dying some, at, at some point between this, these two. And so how about this whole problem about people discussing if it's two smiths or just one swordsmith? So let's start, uh, let's, let's look at it in a, from a chron chronological point of view of all the sword texts we have. So the first sort document, we have the oldest one, 1316, 
uh, Raikon Doshi was still alive at this point it was written and they all say it was just one guy. So there was the just list Raikon Itoshi, he was a maker in Kyoto, one guy, no one says anything about two generations. And this was kept all the way. The next one we have, 1381, also says one smith. 1483 also says there was still one smith. And then suddenly, 1570, uh, they start uh, the documents say uh, there were probably two smiths. So why was that? So, 1611, also two smiths, and this is important because when we look at this time period here, as you can see, it's Momoyama to early Edo, and this was when the, all the, the Honami family were employed by Hideyoshi and Tokugawa Yeah, so this, was, this meant like a boom for the sword scholarship. So what the Honami did, they know Honami were uh, looking at all Oshigata collections, they were making Oshigata collections themselves, and they saw plates, that are mid Kamakura, they signed just Kunitoshi, two characters, and they saw, they saw blades that are a whole different style, late Kamakura, and it has to be two smiths. There was with one and another one because there's, uh, the style is so different. So that's what they assumed. And all this was going on actually until the 1970s. They all assumed there was two guys. Two guys, the early Chuyu papers by the MBDHK said clearly Niji Kunidoshi and Rai Kunidoshi were two guys. But then a next generation of sword scholars arrived, like Tanobe Sensei and all those, and they were actually looking at the bigger picture. They were also having more access to material. They were able to, to compare different schools, not just the Rai school. And they and Tanobe, first and foremost Tanobe he realized, no, we see this change in style with other smiths as well. For example, Osafune Nagamitz, as you all know, famous master, and we see the same uh, style change that his and uh, Raikou Nidoshi and Nagamitz, they're often considered like as, the, as the, the twin brothers, as you can see here. They have like the same large body of works that were active at the end of the Kamakura period and and they have, they were the heads of the heads of a giant school. They were supported by the students. They were the, like acting as grandmasters. So, and we see the same style change with Osafune and Nagamitsu too. So, as you can see, Nagamitsu here, and we're gonna look at plates very shortly, so I can show you the styles, how they develop. I just wanna wanted to show you how this changed. Nagamitsu here, very flamboyant, mid Kamakura Ichimonji style. And then end of Kamakura, it gets a little bit more calm and pretty much calm at the very end of Kamakura turning into, uh, into Nambokchu. The same as Raikunidoshi, very flamboyant. They start with a lot of Choji, then end of Kamakura it gets calm and then it gets very calm. So the consensus now is scholars now think it was only one smith, so mm -hmm. that's now the common knowledge. It was just two phases in uh, the career of a, a single swordsmith, but we still use the terms just to, to refer to the early phase of his career and the late phase. So Nichi Kunidoshi just refers to his early phase and Rai Kunidoshi the late phase, but uh, everyone is probably in agreement that it's like it was one guy. And also interesting is when we look at signatures of the, the two characters, Nichi Kunidoshi and Rai Kunidoshi, we see a transition. If you look at the at the at the, at the top left of the, of the character Bakuni, you see how the early Rai Kunidoshi signed the same way. So he had these three strokes cramped in the left top left corner and then he was uh, spacing him out more. So it's also like the national transition of a style of a single guy. So he signed the same way in the Nichi Kunidoshi phase and then changed gradually. And so now we're gonna start talking about uh, introduce a few blades. Marcus, I'm yep. sorry, but the second uh, signature on the left, on, on the right hand side, right, that three uh, uh, from the Kuni character, right, mm -hmm. it's even in like a different direction, right? All yeah. The other ones are pointing like down, right? Mm -hmm. Whether this one is actually right. pointing up, right? That's still his, right? This is, uh, this is a good question. We're gonna come in the next chapter because you can see how the Kuni, the strokes are like slanting, mm -hmm. you can identify who of his sons was making daimei for him. So Rai Kunimitsu and Rai Kunitsugu, 
because he, you know, they have they had a great output. So it was not just Raikou Nitoshi making all his plates. So also his sons made them, and you can see with the strokes. And I'm gonna I, I'm gonna show you a, a chart next time where you can see how you can identify sons making this. Thank you, Marcus. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's possible that some of this work that especially is unsigned, right, or Oshiriagi, right, mm -hmm. is actually made by his uh, sons? Yeah, when you have something that's end of Kamakura mm -hmm. and, you know, when he was already 80 something years old, it was probably made by his sons at this time. But like Osafune and Agamitsu was like a giant school. They had orders like all across the country and so let's, let's, let's take a look at some of the, of the works and let's start with the Niji Kunitoshi face. So, as you can see here, it's a very uh, typical blade of, of what they assumed that was Niji Kunitoshi, what was a different myth, but it's typical mid Kamakura. You can see uh, the characteristics here are a Tori Sori. And it's important because we have to, that's how you distinguish them from pieces and swords. So, if you have a blade that's mid Kamakura and looks very flamboyant, ichimonji, and you don't, you're not sure if it is its piece, and you have to look at the sori. If it's a tori sori, which is uniform, you know the deepest point at the center, it's very possible it's a right, it's a right blade, because pieces and would have koshi sori. You have like the deepest point of the curvature lowers towards the tang. Also very typical for Nichi Kunitoshi is uh, this compact Kisaki which tends to Ikubi. So this all mid Kamakura as you can see here. And also we have to uh, look it's very little taper. So this is a typical mid Kamakura shape. Very robust, not much taper, smallish Kisaki and Tori Sori, uh, that's typically for, for Nichi Kunitoshi. Uh, I want to show you another play, the Tokubetsu Chuyo, that's very typical for his. Just to see, uh, that I want to show you in the next slide on Oshigata. If you look at this, you, if you pick it up somewhere, you might think it could actually be like a Pisen plate, if you just look at it very, very briefly. But the, the thing here, you have to be uh, on the lookout for Nie. So if you have something like here, you have Sunagashi and you have see the Nie, it would, it's, it's likely it's not Pisen. So if you have a flamboyant, very uh, Ichimonji style plate, but you see a, a certain amount of Nie, you're not gonna, you just don't go for the Pisen, you just think it's, it's possibly it's, it's, a, it's a right plate. Also here in the Kisaki, so you have see if you, it's this kunie, you can see here that's that's like a a, a hint you would like come and arrive at right kunidoshi, not this at pisen. There's another uh, nichi kunidoshi play here, very robust shape. Uh, it's true pichutsu hint. It's shortened, but the, the the little taper is still there. The compact kisaki, the flamboyant hamon, and just to show you the oshigata of this plate and the the characteristics here. That's how the, you have to look at the Nie, the presence of Nie, and there's also a Nie Utsuri that was uh, introduced by the rice coal. So I'm gonna repeat myself, but if you see a lot of Nie it's, and it's flamboyant, it's not Bisen. It's, but also uh, Nichi Kunitoshi, towards his later phase, he also made some very, he made some more elegant plates like this. So a little less aggressive, a little more taper, and you can see it's a Tokubetsu Chuyu blade here, it's signed Kunitoshi, and that's the Oshigata, and what you can see here is already something that's very typical for the rice cool later throughout history, and that's Muneyaki. So very, if you see Muneyaki somewhere and Nie, that's typical for, for Rai in general. And now with this more uh, elegant, unobtrusive style, we're gonna enter the phase of Rai Kunitoshi when the art, the, the swordsmith started to sign with Rai. So the earliest blade that's actually signed with Rai is from 1289. So as you, I have told you, he was born in 1240, he was in his late 50s, so he had a lot of time to sign just a Nichi Mei. So. And that's here, uh, an Oshigata of, uh, of a Chuyo Bunkasai, which is that this is like textbook Rai Kunitoshi. 
you just uh, to see the shape, it's, it's more elegant than mid Kamakura, it's late Kamakura. And just to show you the characteristics here, you have those ashi, they are like leaning towards the Nakago, and this is referred to as uh, Kyosaka ashi. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a long term, you, what you have to just memorize is it's just slanting ashi in the Kyoto style. That's what they call Kyosaka ashi. That's typically for Rai. If you read somewhere Kyosaka ashi, yeah, it's probably Rai Kunitoshi. And also here you have the Muneyaki again. It's a textbook example of, of Rai Kunitoshi's work. But he also made at the same time, uh, this is like almost dated the same as 1321. He also, he still made some more flamboyant styles. Still, there's some, there's some transitional period between the two. And just to show you uh, another one, it's very textbook for, for Rai Kunitoshi here. You have the same, you have the Kyusaka Ashi, some slanting stuff going on. You have Muneyaki, you have Nie, there's some taper. So that's very, very typical for his style. And so because the question was raised uh, last time, I, I wanted to show you uh, some of this, what's usually associated with the rice coal is Rai Hada, which I tried to find some decent pictures here. It's difficult. So Rai Hada is usually, you have some patches in the steel that don't have any forging structure. They're like uh, Muji. They're not itame or anything. You have like these plain little patches here with no, restruct, no forging structure. And it's assumed because they had such a great output, the rice coal, they were like economically thinking they had a very thin outer jacket of steel. And if you keep polishing those plates, the, the core sh shines through and the core is not as refined. And that's why you don't have any like noticeable forging structure here. But basically Rai Hada is the same as Sumihada, Sumigane, like in the Aoe, it's just a different word. Because if you just say patches, you don't know what is meant. But if you say Sumihada, you know it's an Aoe blade. Or if you hear Raihada, you know it's a Rai blade. But it's the same thing. It's just some patches without any, any structure. And I did this display at the MPDHK Sword Museum a while ago. They actually had some examples out there and circle it in so you can look at, you know, what you're looking at. Like here are some patches without any forging structure in the steel. And uh, I try to find another picture, which is, you can see here, again, we have these patches, which are, have no forging structure. That's typically a Raihada. And you, if, it's, if the blade is not tired, you would not expect to see this on a, on a PCM blade. So it's very typical for Rai. And just one more picture to show you here. Another one here, the patches here, this is the typical Rai Hada. So, so that yep. is the same as Sumigani? It's the same as Sumigani. Oh, okay. it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's connected to the steel, it's not a hardening uh, activity. It's just if you go down too deep in the deeper layers, okay. the, the core shows through. So when so, I get all excited and I see blank spots like that, I shouldn't be. No, you're <laughs> Not on a Shin Shinto. <laughs> you can see it on a Shin Shinto when I try to recreate dry, so it's also <laughs> difficult. So, it was a lot, uh, so Nichi Kunitoshi was a lot of uh, uh, information today, so I wanna just keep it brief and I wanna focus on the tanto of the two guys the next time. So today was just to show you Nichi Kunitoshi, Rai Kunitoshi, their style changed and it's today, they assume it's, it was actually one smith. And so that was, the, that was my take for today. And just uh, before I'm gonna end it here, I just wanted to do some little shameless plug of my own. <laughs> As some of you know, I am translating a Homa's appraisal diary. So mm -hmm. I was able to translate the first five, year, five years, and he published this in the, in the Token Pichutsu magazine but from 69 to 83. And that's like the, like the high level uh, Kante, and he's very frank there. He sometimes says, yeah, Kansan thinks it's this, but it's not this. <laughs> so <laughs> this, Usually you don't see this in any Chuyu explanations or in any Sayagaki, but in, the, in his appraisal diary he's pretty frank. So, that's, so I'm still working on it, there are going to be more, many more volumes. If you're interested and get the first two that are finished, just, uh, just grab me and I'm going to figure it out. So you can see 400, play, 400 plates in the first one, about 300 plates in the second volume. So it's going to be a giant library of, the, uh, of very high-end appraisal oh, cool. writings. 
And just to show you a few pictures for what the book looks like, it's like this. Here's some, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's a diary. He writes, oh, I saw this blade on the 26th and someone brought it to me and it's an Ichimonji, it's very good, or it's, it's tired. So, so that's the appraisal diary I wanted to plug in today. If you're interested, just let me know. And with this, I want to just stop it now and <laughs> so much have any questions. Yeah. Yep. Can you go back to the <laughs> previous uh, slide with me? So I also noticed in the, the book, right, mm -hmm. where he says that, for example, you know, Saigaki was issued, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes he would put, uh, you know, Saigaki description in there, right? So mm -hmm. that also can be like a reference. Mm -hmm. If you have a blade with a Saigaki on it, you can actually yeah, look it, it should up. be in the diary. You can yeah. look, look it up to see what was his thoughts around that sort, right. you know, when he was looking at yeah. it, examining and putting mm -hmm. the Saigaki. That's what I yeah. found extremely, you know, valuable. Right. Yeah. And he also writes himself later in the series that it, it was not supposed to be like this, but it actually, like with the Honami papers, it, his appraisal diary can be used to like certify Sayagaki. Because if, it's, if it has a song, uh, Sayagaki between 69 and 83, it should be in his diaries. So he, he is very, he's very like, chronologically precise. So thank you very much. Do you have any more questions? <laughs> Very, very good uh, video which we posted all five, uh, well, now it'll be five episodes of uh, the Goki Den. So if you miss anything and you, or you want to just go back and review, go to our website. All of these videos are, are up there. It's, you know, if you're starting new, go back to the beginning. It's not that long. So that's one thing. There are three just sources of reference. We've done Goki Den. I've been doing this, I guess, about 25 years. This is, every five years we do this. They're never this good. Mark has just an incredible job on it. They're so easy to follow, and very intelligent, and very coaching. So, you know, this is the best of the best. This guy's amazing. That's not Thank you, Chuck. Number two, there's uh, a couple of shows coming up. There's a show in Chicago in the end of April. Um, I'm going to go. There's usually several guys from the New York Club shows. You should really try to make it. If you pay for you, you get in. Not that it's a big deal, but it's 25 bucks. The club pays for you. Um, there's another one in Orlando in June. It's uh, the first venture for, for Mark Sestovich, so we'd like to support him. So again, that's in Orlando in June. And then there's always the big one in San Francisco, which is in the beginning of August. Mm -hmm. So anybody who wants any information, come see me. It's all on the, you know, it's all out there, you know. On the website. It's on our website, all this information. Just to let you know, I'm in touch with Mark and they have an amazing social display at the Orlando show. Yeah. I think they have more than a dozen social blades of Chuyo level, so if you can make it in June, oh, it's going to be awesome. Are you going to be speaking about them? Or, uh, yeah. Yes. Oh. So, so, I can. so, another reason to go, so that's, that's great. Um, so, I guess that's, that's about it. So, you know, I think that's it. We're not kicking anybody out, so those of you who are able to we have just uh, briefly, I didn't talk about it, but there's a very nice display of uh, Higo fittings, primarily uh, Uchikashra, and very, fittings very specific to the Higo school, it's like uh, Gata, which is the curved shaped uh, Suba, which are, there are other schools that used it, but uh, the Higo schools were one of the predominant schools that we use them. And the Fujikashra, they're very unique to the Ego School. They're they're covered with leather. They're lacquered. They're, they're you know very strange. Nobody can actually explain why they covered their Fuji with leather. But there's a bunch over there. Some great ones. Take a look. And, uh, and I have a new um, Nara Toshinaga Fujikashiro, which is you should study it. It's, it's, they're very rare. I've been doing this for again 25 years. First one I've ever had. It's probably the only one in the United States. He's, Big name, take a look at it, study it, whatever. So that's it. Good turnout today. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Good start for the new year. And uh, let's keep up the good work, everybody. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.